Morning. Are there any questions? We seem to be having an issue with uh, attendance. You're here, the other people are not. But those who will be watching, it's unfortunate that during the part of the semester we're actually doing control, people find it unnecessary, other than the two, four, six, eight people who are here, everyone else seems to find it unnecessary to come to class. That's a good sign that they're not interested in doing well in the class because this is an actually learning material. Because uh, when you go out to your job, you're going to need to do control. And that's what we're doing now with the actual control part of the class. Um, it is disappointing. Um, OK, so if you remember, at the end of the last hour, we were looking at, and actually in part of the last hour, we were looking at methods for, first of all, we were looking at uh, the last few classes, we were looking at methods for finding the constants of a tuning constants, that is kc, tau i, and tau d for the PID controller, which we were concentrating on. So first we looked at a uh, brute force method of finding them, uh, which just involved lots of calculations. Then we looked at <coughs> um, a correlation method for where we basically approximated a given system, any system, by a first order system followed by a delay. That is not always a great approximation, but it's somewhat in the ballpark. Um, and based on that, we were able to come up with correlations to find the, uh, a good set of tuning constants for that particular model. Now, that's only as good as the actual model. If the simplified model is not very good, a very good representation of the true system, then the tuning constants are only going to be approximate. The nice thing about the PID controller is that it's very forgiving. Uh, small errors in the model uh, don't really affect the uh, stability of the PID controller. It doesn't do the job as long as you're in the ballpark. Um, once we had that, then we decided we were going to look at how to uh, discuss stability. Of course, uh, one of the problems when you uh, introduce, when you have a dynamic system, an, a, system that can be uh, that has a time dependence is that it can go unstable. Now the system can be unstable without a controller or with a controller. What we would like to make sure is no matter what happens without the controller, when we put the controller on we choose tuning constants to make sure that the control system is stable. In effect, the word control, we're controlling it, we're keeping it from becoming unstable. So that's sort of the goal. And but how do we assess Stability. How do we assess whether the constant we're choosing are making the system stable or unstable, etc.? So we spoke about two methods, one method in detail, and then the second method we started with. The first method was called the root locus, root, R-O-O-T, like the root, of, the root of an equation. And locus is the locus is, is the, the, the positions of the roots. And what we saw was that in a system where there's only one parameter that's changing that we can adjust, say if we have proportional only control, so we only have KC, it's the only thing we can adjust, whereas all the model system, the models of the system, so the time constants of the system, and the steady state gain are already fixed, so the only thing I can play with is KC, then what we saw is that's quite nice because what we can do is we can plot the roots of the denominator of uh, the overall gene, if say it's an S prime, then the roots of this denominator, if it, which is actually the same in both, we can plot the roots of the denominator, and that's what controls the stability. We can plot the roots of the denominator as a function of Kc. And we can see uh, for what values of Kc are all the roots have negative real parts. And for what values of Kc, if any, uh, do the <coughs> Roots cross over the imaginary axis and start giving me positive real parts, which means I'm unsafe. We said that that is a very nice method of doing things, except it really is only, uh, it becomes unwieldy if I have more than one parameter I can change. So if I have proportional only control, that's fine. But once I go to a PID controller, I have three parameters I can play with. And then it's just unwieldy. I need a, an, an enormous number of plots. So we need a better method. And the method we came up with was the Bodet method. Um, and this uh, the Bodet method 
is something they use. Those plots that we made earlier in the semester, at the time we didn't know why we were making them. We thought we were doing it just for fun. But, of course, it's always fun to make plots. But you can see that they're actually quite useful. <clears throat> if you recall, the Baudet uh, plot was we took G tilde, we took G, the, um, the transfer function, and we can calculate the amplitude ratio was G, uh, G of I omega, absolute magnitude. And we saw that the uh, phi, the time lag, was equal to the arc tangent of the imaginary part of G of I omega over the real part of G of I omega. So what, if we know the transfer function, we know the um, amplitude ratio, we know phi, and we calculated a number of examples. For one of them, uh, we, uh, for the first order and the second order process, I plot them here. I plotted these solutions uh, for the log of the amplitude ratio versus the log of omega. Well, remember, what's going on here is this comes from frequency response. I put a sine function coming in with frequency omega, and I see what comes out. So here, omega is the frequency of the sine function, m sine omega p. And here you can see the log of the amplitude ratio. And it uh, starts out uh, as omega goes to zero. The log of omega goes to minus infinity, and this goes to one. As omega goes to infinity, it just becomes a straight line with slope minus one. Whereas for a second order case, it's similar, but the slope becomes minus two here. Uh, as far as the phase uh, lag, for a first order system, as omega goes to zero, the phase lag goes to zero, but as omega goes to infinity, the phase lag goes to minus pi over two. For a second order system, it goes from zero to minus pi. So those are some examples, and of course there are many others which are detailed in figure 10.3 in your textbook. They actually make these plots for many different systems. They also do it for the controllers, for proportional only, Proportional integral, proportional derivative, the ID controller, they also do the choose. Now, why do they do that? Well, um, if you uh, remember, um, well, actually, let me go through the uh, Baudet method and then I'll remind you of something. So, in the Baudet method, what we're trying to do is we're trying to experimentally, uh, if you like, determine the stability of the system. So one way of doing that is we start out by cutting the system right here. So if we cut it, then this no longer attaches here, so it's open loop. And we're going to look at a situation where S P prime is not zero, but D prime is zero. So we're going to take a situation where there's no disturbance. We're doing this experiment so we can set it up. And we cut the loop. And then what we do is we introduce a sine wave. We introduce M, uh, SP prime is M sine omega. And we wait for steady state. Now what we know is if I have m sine omega t coming in, then because this is a linear system, I still have a sine wave coming out. When I say coming out, it enters here and goes around the loop. And over here, I have an amplitude ratio times m sine omega t plus phi. So the, if I have a frequency m sine omega t here, then I know that what comes out after going around this loop is it has the same frequency, but it can have a phase lag phi, and it has an amplitude ratio, which is the amplitude of the output over the amplitude of the input. This is the ratio of the amplitude of the output over the input, and is the amplitude of the, of the input. So the product is the ratio of the output. Okay, so great, I'm in steady state. Now what I'm going to do is, and notice, that to get from here to here, I have to go through GC, GV, GP, and GS. 
So I have to go through the output. So 
If you never as GF and Lupus a product of four Gs, nothing to do with yourself. They're five G. This is the product of four transfer functions. So let's recall that um, if I have the product of Gs, each GI, each G, well let's let's look at uh, yeah, each G. Each of the Gs can be written as a complex number. For any omega. If it's a complex number, <coughs> this is the real axis, this is the imaginary axis. If it's a complex number, then it has a real part and an imaginary part. I could they might think of it in Cartesian coordinates, or in polar coordinates, I can think of it as an angle, theta, and it has a magnitude, the magnitude of G of I omega. So it has a magnitude and an angle. Angle phi here. And phi is the arc tangent of the imaginary part of the real part. The arc tangent of the imaginary part of the real part. And the magnitude is just the amplitude ratio. So this complex number, G tilde by omega, is a vector in two dimensions. And in polar coordinates, it has a magnitude and an angle. And the magnitude and the angle is simply the amplitude ratio and the phase length. Okay, well, notice if it's, so I can write G tilde, G of I omega, as the magnitude of G of I omega, times E to the I phi. Where we said, why can I do that? Because, let's go back with it a second. G of I omega is equal to the magnitude of I omega times the cosine of phi. That's the x coordinate. Uh, and the unit vector here is 1. And here the unit vector is i. So plus i times the magnitude of g of I omega times the sine of phi. That's this piece. So this is magnitude of g times the cosine of phi. And this is the magnitude of g times the sine of phi. And we know that uh, this is equal to the magnitude of G of I omega times E to the I phi, because we've defined E to the I phi as cosine phi plus I sine phi. That's exactly what I factored down here. So notice that G of I omega is the magnitude times E to the I phi. So what does that tell me? That tells me if I have a product of Gs, Gj of I omega, if I have a product of them, I could write it in this way as the product of J of Gj of I omega, magnitude, times the product of E to the I phi J, where phi J, actually I just need the, yeah, I can write it this way, it terms the product separate products. It's really one product, but I can first multiply the magnitudes together and then I can multiply these guys together. And I can notice that this is just pi j of gj of i omega. So that tells uh, times the product of exponentials times e to the i times the sum of the phi k's. So what does that tell me? That tells me, notice that g of i omega is a number times, which is the product of the individual amplitude ratios, these are the individual amplitude ratios, and this is e to the i times the sum of the individual phase lengths. So that tells me that g open loop at of i omega, which is the amplitude ratio of open loop, is just equal to the product of the four G, to G of I omega, Gj of I omega, where these are the four of them, one, four, 
and phi of the root is just equal to phi s plus phi p plus phi v plus phi left c. So phi of the loop is just the sum of the four phi's. And the amplitude ratio is just the product of the four amplitude ratios. I did this again the last hour, so I'm just reviewing it. Because this is important, I don't want to just run through it once. Um, at least there are two, four, six, eight, nine people interested enough to be here to actually see it. Um, those who don't come, remember, if you have more than three absences, you'll have the pleasure to take this class again next year. Okay. Um, well, let's see. So what it, why, am I, why is this interesting? Well, the first thing we can notice is a second order system can be thought of, this, we can think of this as one CSTR, and many second order systems are like two CSTRs in series. So if there are two CSTRs in series, then GP is the product, remember, processes in series, the G's multiply by each other. So GP itself can be thought of for two CSTRs in series as the product of two, CF, uh, of two G1s, of a G for one CSTR times a G for another CSTR. Since when I take the product of G's, I take the sum of the phi's, that's like saying, for two CSTRs, I take this twice and I add them. And that's why when I take two of these and add them, I go from zero not to minus pi over two, or from zero to minus pi. If I took three of them, if I had three CSTRs in series, then I would take three of these and add them together. And I would go from zero to minus three pi over two. Now why is this relevant? If I just have a first order system, no matter what I do to omega, I can never get omega down to minus pi, so the system's stable. If I have only a second order system, overall, a kill the loop is second order, then I know that I can never get to minus pi for a finite value of omega. I can go out to infinity to get this. So that system is also marginally marginal stable. I can never quite get there. On the other hand, once I get to third or higher order systems, I can certainly, if this goes down to minus three pi over two, then I can certainly get to minus pi. And that's where we get to use the voting criteria. Do I have questions now? Before we do some examples. Now, before we do some examples, uh, notice that since the overall phi is the sum of all the constituent phi's, even phi p itself might be the sum of some constituent phi's if there are multiple pieces of equipment in P. For example, like CS goes in series. But even once I have phi p, I still have to add phi s, phi b, and phi c. So what that says is, instead of taking the whole g, the whole nasty equation, this g open loop, and from that big nasty equation, trying to calculate the overall phi, that usually involves a lot of algebra. What I, this is an amazing, enormous simplification. I could just look at the phi's of the much simpler systems. Just the controller, just the valve, just the measuring device, just the process, and just add them. It's much easier. And that's what figure 10.3 in your textbook is. It's a bunch of Bodet blocks for control schemes, different control schemes, different GPs. So it makes life easier because I can just add things together. And let's uh, go ahead and maybe do a couple of examples. Are there any questions on that? Okay, so here, let's, I'm going to memorize the example. Let's uh, put the example on the blackboard. 